Hi folks, welcome back to the exciting conclusion of day one of Generation Analog. Um, and of course, um, I'd, I'd say we'd save the best for last, but all the panels have been the best. So, uh, but this one will also be the best, so you get it. Um, anyways, I am so, so, so excited um, to introduce this amazing uh, panel of um, experts on colonization and uh, race in games. I think this is going to be an amazing conversation. Uh, in a lot of ways, it's a conversation that goes back um, decades in a uh, sort of tabletop gaming hobby. Uh, many ways it got opened up by Bruno Fiduti's undoubtedly problematic essay on uh, post-colonial Catan, um, but it's really been taken away both by people and sort of the hobbyist space, but also in the academic space in a variety of ways since then. And I'm just so excited to see what our panelists have to share with us today. So without further pomp and circumstance, uh, I'll get along with introducing folks. So first we have Mary Flanagan. Um, Mary Flanagan is going to be uh, presenting her paper, Values and Enculturation in Tabletop Games. And Mary has been an artist, author, game designer, and quirky professor. She started the game company Resonim to bring socially conscious approaches to board games. As an artist, her works have been exhibited at museums across the world, such as the Whitney, the Guggenheim, Tate Britain, and museums in Spain, New Zealand, South Korea, China, and Australia. In 2018, Flanagan won the award of distinction at Prix Art Electronica at the Interactive Art Plus. Flanagan was ordered, awarded an honorary PhD in design by Illinois Tech and has held numerous honorary fellowships and holds a distinguished professorship at Dartmouth College, USA. She's also the author and co-editor of numerous books such as Critical Play and Reload, Rethinking Women in Cyber Culture. And I'll always have a soft spot in my heart for Critical Play because I remember reading it after my very first year in grad school, sitting on the beach and thinking about Yoko Ono's chess games and stuff like that. So um, I'll give it to you, Mary. Welcome. Wow, thanks. I'm, I'm glad the book gets to the beach. It's more than I get to do, actually. Um, let me just set up and share my screen with my special sharing system here. One sec. I'll take a look. It's, I'm on a very small screen, so I have some disco dancing to do here. Um, let me try this here. Sharing. Okay. Da, da, da. Okay, we're trying this. That is a little strangely sized and half of you are in it. You won't bear with me. <laughs> bear with me, bear with me. Move everybody. Okay, you're over there. All right down here. Da, da, da. Okay. Almost, almost. Oh, okay. Oh, all right, great. We're on. Um, yes, so values and enculturation in tabletop games is uh, my topic for today. And I wanted to explore with you all the ways in which different genres of games across the centuries embody or manifest social values. The idea of a community, uh, the communities instilling a belief embedded within the culture at large um, during different eras. And I'm really excited to um, be sharing this work uh, that is part of a book that is forthcoming from MIT Press with my collaborator, Mikhail Jakobsen. Um, and I'm so pleased to be on this panel because all of you are mentioned in this book um, by, because of your amazing work. So I'm, I'm very uh, honored to be um, on this panel with you all. Um, and also some of the thoughts that uh, have come out from this, uh, this research are from um, Values at Play and Digital Game, written with my colleague, Helen Niesenbaum, who's a philosopher. Um, so I wanted to just include their voices in this talk as well um, and, and give a shout out to them. So games have long expressed the values of their surrounding culture, right? So this is particularly important at this historical moment when board games could be created on paper and mass produced, utilizing imagery in their design in the printing process. I'm not saying that strategic abstract games don't have values or meanings embedded in them, but that specific printed games or games with pictorial images have a particular kind of potency. And we see this even in hand painted games like the Jane Guyan Chauper, 
um, and older Sugoroku games that were distinctly tied to values. Uh, Guy and Chopper, a very old game from the Indian subcontinent that is designed to teach spiritual liberation and moral philosophy in a board game. There are Hindi, Jain, and Muslim versions of this game, which was later stolen, stripped of its cultural context, and sold as snakes and ladders by British colonizers. <laughs> Sugoroku games from Japan often reflected themes of education, such as like a top 100 poets or aspects of daily life, like this one in my slide, which is featuring everyday household activities of the time. So we, we see that board games were, with more detailed representation systems, these pictorial or printed games, offer the opportunity to observe and play out cultural differences and specificities, cultural details and specificities. Certainly the development of games that depicted scenes and figures instead of abstract concepts not only changed the meaning of games, but their social and political connections. And pictorial and, uh, and scenario-based games function worldwide as a form of influence or even propaganda, conveying a unity of cultural message or vision in some cases to disseminate ideas supported by the state. In other words, games are intrinsically linked to promoting certain views and values. Whether designers intend them to or not, I would argue that's the, another part of my uh, conversation. So I'm going to briefly run over um, three games as exemplars um, to, to make this point about enculturation. Um, two, you're probably all familiar with Settlers of Catan, Spirit Island, but um, I wanted to start off by just kind of starting off in a potentially, never say never, potentially non-colonial space of the Jew to the Revolution Francaise. Um, and in these games, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just talk about how they've acted as tools for enculturation. And I, what I mean by enculturation is this gradual process by which people learn the culture of their group by living in it, observing it, and being taught things by members of their group, or I would argue members of uh, players of games. So the French Revolution game, moder the whole name is modeled after the Greek game of the goose, 1791. Um, it, it's the idea of enculturation is most obvious in this game, um, a game of the goose style race game um, with hand colored etchings. And it's thought to have been released uh, within uh, months of the festival of the Federation celebration on July 14th, 1790. So we're talking a year after the French Revolution. And the game depicts the events of the French Revolution, such as the storming of the Bastille um, and all kinds of other events that took place. And so if, this is a very familiar game to uh, people around the world. Um, it's a race-based game, a game of the goose. It's said that be, uh, it's called that because of goose spaces, which I'll show in a moment. 63 spaces, first player to get to the circle um, in the middle wins. And I'm, I'm particularly interested in this game because it serves as this pop culture vehicle to instill the values of the French Revolution among um, French people right after the revolution has happened. And so, so there's these intriguing spaces on the board and that are common to most, if not all Game of the Goose games, include things like the bridge, which is generally space six that transports players to space 12, the hotel, which is space 19 that you have to stay on for one turn overnight. Um, the prison space 52, the well is what we see here, um, which is very kind of humorously depicted. Um, and that's a really unfortunate space where you get stuck there until somebody takes your place and then they get stuck there. So it's really a terrible design idea, but whatever. <laughs> um, so typically in goose games, there are all of these goose spaces, which means a player moves ahead by the same amount rolled to get to that space. So it's like a double roll. And um, in this game, they're clothed and they're wearing bridles. OK, and this is a very strange representation of a goose. But it's present um, because it's there, there was a, 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 a Adrian Seville, who's done a ton of work on, on this particular um, genre of board game, talked about it as bridled geese, um, was referring to a Rabelais um, character, Judge Bridiot, um, bridal goose, that meant nincompoop. So there are cultural in-jokes um, framed inside these images inside the game, as well as, um, this is a really great one, um, th this is the text, who will go to the number 58 or death? or heads on the ends of pikes paid the agrees, agreed upon price and starts the game again. Also, there was a lot of money exchange in these kind of games. There's a lot of betting and it's part of the rule. So, um, so that's also very interesting to note. So for our purposes today, the game of the French Revolution has this particular symbolic notions represented on the game, denouncing the old ways and celebrating the new. One example is this good riddance of unnecessary taxes. Uh, such as this square, which is the abolition of the deem, which was a tax on peasants in the form of tithing the landlord, um, also depicted 
are um, the, the, the um, suppression of religious orders, which was part of the theme of the French Revolution, this uh, notion of laïté, um, and um, uh, the Catholic Church was seen as an extremist religious organization, and so it was dismantled and property given away. And so this is like celebrating this, um, taking the property from um, the wealthy and from the religious. And um, the other square is about um, a, a kind of a question about how, how uh, immigrants are enculturated, and it uh, mentions if people are dressed as though, if foreigners are dressed as though they are French and follow the French ways, they can become French. So all of these kinds of notions of what is like, what is French culture is embedded in here, including Sa Ira, which is this um, French revolution song that was uh, sung for the Fête de la Fédération. So, so, so no one knows who made the first edition of this game, but in fact, the game was redesigned, reprinted and played for over a hundred years. It was kind of like the monopoly of its day. And there are many versions of this game and um, it really facil facilitated these conversations um, and brought about social norms and into conversations. And mechanically, um, while this kind of game seems really kind of boring to us right now, the format of a race game, it does work nicely with this metaphor of progress. There's this notion of progress and, and, and there have been Game of the Goose games about Pilgrim's progress and other kinds of progress, right? So there's a lot of investment in, in the way in which the mechanics also reflect these ideas. And that's where I get really interested in how mechanics, you know, let's move beyond representation. Representation can be fixed. Mechanics, are another animal. And that's when I wanna to go to Settlers of Catan. We'll do this other reading about enculturation. The, uh, you know, we know this game very well, set up to create islands, drawing a collection um, of hexes that re produce resources, pastures produce wood, I mean, wool, uh, uh, mountains produce ore, et cetera. And um, these pieces are laid out to build the otherwise empty island, um, which is, you know, that controversial article talks about. Um, and the goal of this game is for players to set up roads and settlements on the island and receive resources. So the first observable problem here is that the game lays out a model for unlimited resources, both an unsustainable message and one that has even darker undertones. And I'll continue on. It might, we might argue that the use of this map-like island is a model beloved by fantasy and science fiction writers from the 18th century onwards to make their fantasy worlds more realistic. But note that this practice of terra incognita came about during mapping the world for future European colonies. Fantastic stories of discovery, buried treasure, and so on are rooted in colonial enculturation that was a core European value of the 19th century. So these games also show a steady thread of me mechanics leading to problematic games. So I'm thinking about European games in, in particular. So let's, let's recount the challenges for a conscientious player of a game I love, you know, um, but we have to, we, we can love things that are problematic <laughs> and try to unpack that. Somehow players find these unlimited resources provided by whom? Colonies and colonial rule, which provided low cost bounty and riches to the colonizer, uncharted territories that were actually home to other people. And the history of violence um, uh, of colonialism is hidden from view. And then there's the robber character the only meeple in the game, activated by a roll of the seven. Um, I already wrote about this infamous robber in Critical Play, for those of you who've read it on the beach. <laughs> but, um, you know, the player has to wonder, did it, did, you know, where, where are the, it, there is a person here, um, where are uh, the other people represented? And there have been kind of discussions about this ongoing for, uh, for quite a long period of time. And this game in many ways works as a catalog of contemporary game mechanics and contemporary Euro game problems. The, original, the origin of such a game came from many influences such as outer space colonial games, Stellar Conquest, Race for the Galaxy and other games discussed in the book that we don't have time for today. And tellers of the Euro game story insist that Germany invented games about building things rather than annihilating opponents with peaceful premises and intricate rules. Catan is often cited as the model Settlers may be the Mona Lisa of the board game renaissance, Wired Magazine's uh, quoted in 2009. And to be fair, they've responded, uh, various companies publishing this, have uh, responded to criticism through the years, changing the title to Catan, changing the color of the meeple. But um, we still have to question the insides, right? Player experience is uh, this engine building process. Um, and there's a constant need to upgrade um, uh, you know, 
that challenges between players are typically about space and resources. Um, and, and that in, in, in itself defends this Euro game standpoint. But when one does some historical research, you know, I thought, okay, okay, settlers folks responding to the conversations of the time and trying to do the, the right thing. And that's true, but it's also true. We have to question the very premises of the mechanics of many Euro games themselves. I might have believed that Catan was fixed were I not so interested in history. And I was looking for more precursors to Euro games. And I found a great deal, too much to go into here, but visiting German archives and discovering the two above games, um, which we can see in multiple, like multiple strategies. Um, Young Deutland Stattenspiel from 1912 um, to 17, depending on when, which publishing date you go on, was a, was a Boy Scout game um, that militarized children for Imperial Germany's promotion of, of, of militaristic kind of ideology. Um, and and um, the second game, De Colonist then actually makes very literal that trading, you start at the port of a colony and you are doing uh, territory capture. So it's actually, these were outright, that was an outright purposeful inc enculturation of empire mentalities to children, such as, uh, and that was in part of like this Boy Scouts equivalent of a Boy Scouts group book. So, and players in their everyday actions have also made this relationship with, the, with for example, the meeple uh, very clear and explicitly um, political and racist. If you look at what um, someone's saying about what, you know, what do you use, uh, what do you use for their robber character? And it's like, uh, you know, this, the, the quote about um, someone saying I use President Obama. Okay, so this is, this is, this, this, this is really tainted. Um, uh, uh, the, uh, a lot of, of more than just this game, I think. So we have to really look carefully at how our mechanics are actually communicating messages beyond representation. And I want to move to Spirit Island as a kind of more optimistic <laughs> part of my, of my brief time here, um, which is, um, you know, represents a change in the script of colonial games and it offers a new narrative. Um, the, the impetus of this game is playing as the island spirits, you remove colonizers and keep the land and people happy and healthy. And the models embedded in the game, however, do deserve some closer scrutiny. For example, the indigenous people, the Dehan and Spirit Island are only represented through these hut, mushroom hut pieces and do not have their own agency and only act when activated by spirits decisions. Invaders, on the other hand, have more complex factions, several distinct game pieces representing them and their settlements. So there is a generalization um, in this game that, um, that needs to be dealt with in terms of uh, uh, mechanical representation um, and, and just the overall balance issue of, of who gets to do what when. Um, the mechanics still lean toward leaving the power of decision-making and complexity to gods and colonizers, not to indigenous people themselves. And while the Dehan at Spirit Island have more complex backstory and much more spaces allotted to developing the story, the mechanical workings of this game back this up less and focus more on the spirit's power. Um, while Spirit Island realistically demonstrates the speed at which aggressive colonial interests can impact a place and contaminate it, a problem with this complex and interesting game is that the native people, the Dehan, still have, are seen as masses, not individuals, and the rules give them nothing to do. So that's one of the big challenges that we see in, in this game. So using these three exemplars, I, I, I've explored briefly how three very different games have acted as tools for enculturation or the gradual process by which people learn their culture, whatever that culture may be. Uh, I would argue that games have always been educational, uh, whether we think they are educational or not. This is thinking back to Elizabeth's um, talk that we just uh, talked about. Um, uh, as designers, we have to have the responsibility to understand the power of what games can do. Um, so let's recap. The Drew of the, the Game of the French Revolution used the, fr the, the track game to bring the French players into the mentality of this progressive new French Republic. Settlers reinforces this capitalist and colonialist fantasy of unending resources, exploration, and colonizing without cost. And Spirit Island shows a critical awareness of the board game industry's. Uh, um, sh it shows a awareness of this um, history of colonial thinking in board games, um, but does so at, at the expense of this mechanical agency lacking for um, those colonized in the game. So this 
the, the models and norms in some Euro games um, really, really uh, need to be questions. Um, and I, I think it's, it's, there's so many other games that we've discussed and talked about. Um, Mikhail Jakobsen and I have played hundreds and hundreds of colonial games. We've amassed a massive database. <laughs> and, and you can see right here, obviously, um, we're all here because we love game making, playing, and studying. But, um, and I've been critical in this talk. But unfortunately, the new, there are many, many new board games with colonialist themes and problematic mechanics that continue to be published, kickstarted, and published. Rather than representing a fringe occurrence with the board game industry, these games constitute a, 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 a significant number of mainstream Euro ga board games with significant sales levels and critical acclaim on that board game geek list that we've talked about today. So, you know, through a close uh, critical examination, we can we can sh we can see um, really problematic patterns, but. And here's a quote from Brian Sutton Smith to, to kind of give us a little bit of a grounding. Um, what is adaptive about play therefore may not be only the skills that are part of it, but also the willful beliefs and acting out one's own capacity for the future. To play is to act out and be willful as if one is assured of one's prospect. Putting one in a colonial role um, and with the demographics that we have in the board game industry, really, really does then culminate in some problematic um, situation with, um, with what we have developed. Um, this reification of white Western power, capitalistic exploitation. And this is possibly, I would argue, the baked in logic of our everyday playthings. So what are we going to do about that? <laughs> All right. uh, unfortunately, time is up. So I'm going to have to leave that a dangling question that we can come back to in the Q&A. But I think that's exactly the point uh, to leave it off and move on to Rebecca Bay Keck's presentation. But that was excellent. Um, Rebecca um, is going to be presenting on designers of historical African board games, which if you look at Rebecca's illustrious CV, you'll see many amazing essays on similar topics, often in the context of learning, but also in the context of history. So it's just wonderful, wonderful, exciting work. And Rebecca holds a dual PhD in learning, design and technology and complet and international education from Penn State University. Currently, she is a CLIR postdoctoral fellow at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, where she engages in digital research data curation and inclusive design. Her interdisciplinary research is at the interface of several fields, including the learning sciences, literacy studies, and game studies. Here, she explores literacy and learning in games, particularly board games, the interaction of culture, space, and the context on design, learning, research, and literacies. So Rebecca, please show us your work. Um, and Rebecca seems a little frozen for the moment. So um, if she does not come back in a half minute, we'll just move on to Sarah and come back to Rebecca when her internet connection restabilizes. Hi, Rebecca, are you back? Um, maybe you could try turning off your video. That often is um, an issue for lag with presentations. I can't hear you though. So, can you hear me now? Yes, absolutely. Uh, okay. All right. I don't know what happened, but something was going on. So, let me see here. Thank you so much uh, for having me. So let me see if it's going to work here now. All right, so things are working right now. Okay, so thank you so much for your patience. So um, again, so uh, thank you for the introduction, wonderful introduction. So today I'm going to talk here about um, the design of historical African board games. I got interested in the, um, this topic because uh, one thing I've noticed that when it comes to game design, uh, historic African board games and specifically historical African board games are not really uh, engaged in the conversation. So 
And this is how I want to set the setting. So one thing that when you think about game design, the first thing that comes to your mind is definitely video games, right? So, and then when they define video games, they always say, okay, they define game design, they always talk about, you know what, this kind of a subfield, right, of video game development. And then also, it always about computer science and programming, right? It's always about writing, writing uh, um, creative writing and graphic design. So usually, and then with that kind of, even when you talk to game designers, they will always tell you, oh, what do you need to do, right? To get to that stage where you become a game designer, always tell you, you need that kind of programming or technical skills. So that general definition or understanding of game design, actually in that specific focus on technology definitely leaves, leaves out what I would call indigenous games. Some people call them indigenous games, board games, but I must add a caveat here to say that there's actually an emerging conversation, right? And uh, 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 in the game, board game uh, research, talking about you know, uh, board game design. But uh, when it comes to African board games, they are absolutely left out of the conversation. So with that being said, one thing that actually, uh, the, when we also go into defining game design, there's uh, this uh, book by Zubek in 2020 where he talks about game design elements. And then one thing that he mentions that when we talk about game design, you have to consider elements. So he talks about mechanics, the holes, and he talks about the gameplay. He talks about the player experience. But there is something that he also adds of that it called visual design. That's kind of a factor that, according to him, uh, definitely um, influence or shapes right the 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 the, the player's experience. And this for the the board games, he talks. He said that it's going to include why. Right, tactile feel of game pieces of the richness of the board game. And then I thought this is definitely a part that definitely I can apply when you think about African board games, when you think about them, this is a part that an element that you can take into to start analyzing or understanding uh, board game design when it comes to African board games. So one thing that I want to uh, share with you here is that when we think about African board game design, what am I talking about? So I want to define first what I call African board games. So I would say that things that are very specific to them, it has to be of African origin. And what does that mean? Right? It means actually that's played by a community or a group of people. And it has a kind of cultural uh, uh, meaning and all significance within that, within that community. So they have to kind of trace it back. And also uh, people identify with it. So that's what I call an African uh, board game. So. Then the challenge now, so when we combine designing uh, an African board game, so how do we understand it? How do we, uh, how can we make sense of that type of design? So the challenge with uh, African board games when it comes to design is that they are historical. It means that, you know, the designers, we cannot find them anymore. And then the current games that we have actually are almost like uh, the, the kind of reproduction, right, of what was designed. So that's the, the kind of challenge that we're finding. So how am I going to go about now to explain what, uh, to try to understand, right? To kind of break down what I can understand, the design process that these early designers of African board games uh, went through. So one thing that I did with the literature is that I, I kind of went into a different literature. So the literature of architectural design and also the literature of uh, uh, design of uh, game design to actually situate the design of African board games within the literature of, of game design, within the literature, of, uh, within the field of game studies. So what does architectural design tell me? Uh, when it comes to design, architectural design says that, you know what, uh, design is actually embedded and emerging from a social, cultural, historical uh, context. So, and then that drives and shapes the kind of uh, design Right, that of what they call the built-in project, the built-in object. So that's what the, uh, the in general the field, the field of architectural design is. So uh, a, a a game or a building cannot be dissociated from the environment. That environment often and always shapes that uh, the the design object. So. And then I'm just going to take two examples of two African board games. And I will, uh, some of you may recognize all of them here, but I'm, I'm using the game, the name that the communities call the, uh, the specific games. So I will start with the board game that they call uh, Songo. So what is Songo? Songo, as you see on the screen, is um, 
it may not be the greatest picture, but as you see on the screen, this kind of strategy board game uh, played among the Ekang and the Fang ethnic group across uh, Cameroon, Gabon, and Equatorial Guinea. Actually, you will find the uh, uh, so in Cameroon, I, the focus here, uh, the name Songo here, is the game that is played. The one that I'm going to study here and share with you here is the one that's played in Cameroon and actually among the Ewondo people. Because when you see the Ekang and Fang, is a larger ethnic group, and then you have the sub ethnic group, and then the sub ethnic group is the Ewondo people. So as you see on the uh, the screen, so it's a board game. So you have. Uh, 14 holes, you have two holes, and then you play with uh, 76 and 35 divided between uh, two players. And that you the, the, the way of playing the game is that you drop seeds consecutively uh, in each hole, right, by, uh, uh, in turn. And so you make a capture, you win when you have 40 seeds. Again, these goals are specific to uh, uh, each uh, ethnic uh, Group. And the other thing that you want to uh, you want to understand as well with this game is that you cannot make a capture if your hole has four, or you cannot make a capture if your hole has uh, four and then you drop another six. So you cannot make a capture of five, but you can make capture of four, three, uh, two, but not uh, one. So what's Owela? Owela is another strategic board game of the Owakwamaya people, ethnic group in uh, Namibia. So we have the Owakwamaya, we have Obabanja, we have Obabalantu ethnic group in, in Namibia. And uh, one thing that you want to know with this game is that's actually a game, uh, generally you have eight, four, Holes of eight uh, holes, but you can have more than that. So they can de decide to add more holes. So, but generally you find the basic uh, Oela games that you want, you need to have four, four, you definitely have four holes, but the number of holes can uh, change depending on the players and depending on how they feel like, you know what, we want, uh, we, we need more. So, and then those who are definitely tricky and then depending again on the specific ethnic group uh, that is playing the game. So now to kind of start this, uh, kind of you know unpacking while right, trying to understand uh, what I, I, I how these early designers of African board games what kind of process were they engaging and why is it that was influencing them and I want to, you to hold that thought that remember I talked about you know diving into the literature of architectural design to see how place environment all of that shapes and that helped me actually to make sense of. Uh, what kind of process they were going into. So now I went into place. And then when it uh, comes to these uh, specific board games, again, I'm focusing here now on uh, Songo, for example. So I'm going to the, to show that, that you will see that when it comes to the Songo board game, the Songo board game is designed with wood, the Songo board games, and then the, the playing seeds, right? The playing instrument, the playing pieces, I would say. The playing pieces are actually from a tree that they call Jansa. And then Jansang is a tree that actually, for the people who are living in that area of the country, he was kind of the, the, the kind of rainforest part of the country, uh, Jansa is not only a tree, but also a tree that brings, provides some kind of income, but also is used, people are using the, the, the seeds of the tree to actually cook while some look at this, so it's more like a spices. And I, and this, these early designers actually used not only the, the material that was available to them in the area, but also they used the, the something that was kind of part of the way of life, where right? that had meaning within that community, that had kind of part of the environment. Something else that I wanted, oh, that was it. So, but something that I kind of shaved the helm, I'll point for that, but uh, to talk about the place and design. So what you want to understand is that when I talk and define place, I think of place as being the physical location experienced by people, right? It's not just about, uh, um, so you think, uh, you think uh, you, you will consider like the mountains, the rocks and the cities and the, so the, the, cultural places, the, the cultural practices that people are engaged in that specific place. And also one thing that you want to understand as well is that as I think of place as being something that is experienced by people. So as you see and saw on the, the, the other slide is that the, 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 the wood, but also the, the, the playing pieces that they picked were part of the, uh, the daily lives, right? The, like they were using that the Jansa is a tree, the cedar tree that they use for cooking and doing that. And that actually and, uh, 
participated in the design of the game. So architectural design, and now when it comes to design, the actual design always says that, that, that they, oh, they have this understanding that design is always entangled with people's experiences, then the things and so the awareness, right? So the awareness then, and, and then when, where, how they define awareness is all about what is it is mountains and trees and everything that's kind of part of that specific place. And then when you think about the song about and what the kind of pieces and the kind of instrument tools that the, the material that they use to design the game actually shows you that that piece impacted or shaped the design of the specific game. So now we dive into either in the, uh, we go a little bit further in the design because that was, uh, and then I want to specify here that I'm doing some kind of more of a visual uh, like kind of the, the, I'm looking at the visual design, so that kind of those factors, how the game is uh, presented, like that interface is not a screen, but that's kind of uh, the interface that they have. So the Eka and the Fang ethnic group in Cameroon, so they live where in the wet tropical lowland uh, rainforest, right? So, and that's where you have a lot of trees, and that's why you will find that they're using wood, right? And then uh, not only the wood, but also the, the 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 playing pieces. So the playing pieces that they would call Iban in the Wondo language that actually uh, um, show not only the interaction because the specific people what they and then they call it Iban and then I make sure that when in my conversation the only closest word uh, to translating would not be would not be pebbles but would be seeds right because they are a farming uh, community so they rather call it Iban because actually because they are farmers and they are great farmers so they need seeds uh, seeds are the kind of plant and then to grow so that's how again you see how the uh, the not only the the place in terms of uh, the people's activity people experiences actually shape the design of uh, the specific game. The other part that I wanted to share with you and that I found extremely interesting, and I think that's um, why uh, uh, Flag had my, my colleague, her conversation was really also inspiring is that with uh, the question that I was uh, wondering about was like, why do they have seven holes, right? Why do they have seven holes and not 20 or not something? But seven holes in the, um, the Ikan ethnic group is actually the days of the calendar. I'd right? like, like they have seven days in the calendar, so correspond to seven days of the calendar, but also in terms of their cosmology, why right? seven represent purity. And then, so if, let's say if you have a, uh, uh, after the death of someone or a baby dies, right? So you have seven days of purity, kind of to purify yourself and come out of that, uh, let's say, dark place. And if a child is born, right? It's kind of seven days after, then you present him. So that's kind of, uh, and then again, you see here how uh, the way of life, the practices, right? That place, unique in that context, that culture actually shapes the design of uh, this game. The other game that I wanted to talk to you, uh, the other uh, observation, definitely the uh, the, the Wela uh, game, but game that is uh, played by the Awambu people who actually live in a very similar uh, environment and then white sand and it actually places fat. So again, here you will realize that you know what, the, they, they don't have enough uh, enough trees. So what do they pick to design the work? And that they, they, they decode, right? On, on the ground. And then again, this is really good because one thing that I've noticed is that the flatness, the flatness of the land is definitely appropriate for such design. Because if you were finding yourself, let's say in uh, in Cameroon, the morning, what people, they have a lot of hills. So finding a place like that. And then again, so uh, another part is uh, the playing pieces that they're using. The playing pieces is uh, from a tree that they call Mahula. And then the, the local tree, Mahula, how is it used? Mahula is actually used. Uh, they use it to actually produce non-alcoholic uh, drinks. So, so women use it. So, kind of note is uh, almost like I want to say women, but actually people use it to sell, right? So, it's a kind of a, a way to, uh, for them also to uh, get some money. So, as uh, I have them the business and again here, as you will see with the Songo part, uh, the Songo board games are. The place where the game was designed, the place where the game is played, that awareness, right, uh, definitely shapes the design of uh, your Wola board game. So they are one of the uh, uh, people 
are also cattle head, uh, headers. So for them in that specific context that you have for a sign of wealth is a number of cattle that you have. And, and, and here you will see that the playing pieces are actually called Aombe. And then Aombe, what does that mean? It means cattle. So the more pieces you have, it means that you are actually wealthy. So you see how they, um, their, their, their way of life, their practices, right? Everything that they're doing actually shifts where was embedded in the design of the game. So with that, I, I was definitely curious because this is definitely uh, a question that I've been asking myself to find out why is it that now they can decide that it's uh, eight instead of, you know what, uh, uh, that, that they can have actually uh, eight holes instead of maybe 20 or what is that so that part is definitely a question that i say i think myself one thing that's really interesting is that the, if, the generation that Rebecca, we have now yeah um, unfortunately we're out of time do you have one or two last comments for the room absolutely I, and that was definitely uh at the end of it to say just that uh i say thank you for attending your presentation and then i'll i'll open to your questions and uh comments thank you Thank you for the wonderful presentation. Um, moving on, next we have Sarah Lovett with her paper, Reading and Writing About Borders, uh, and there's a pun in there, borders, engaging critical literacy skills and challenging colonial narratives and board games. Sarah does amazing work um, on uh, anti-racist uh, board games and um, thinking through the rhetorics of games. She's a college writing instructor and English PhD cater candidate at the University of Washington. Her specializations include racial and socioeconomic access in writing classes and game-based pedagogies. Um, she is the chair of the Council for Play and Game Studies. Sarah's educational role-playing game, Election 2016, which engages students in rhetorical listening through stakes-driven, audience-focused composition, was published in the winter 2021 issue of One Shot, a journal of critical games and play. And Sarah, thank you for presenting with us today. I'm looking forward to, to seeing your work. Thank you so much. Um, okay, I'm looking at the clock, so I have till 5.26, my time zone. Great, I'm putting that in my head right now. Um, excellent, so I think my presentation is gonna feel a little bit different because I'm basically presenting my course design. Um, so if you're if you're an educator, then this will hopefully be adaptable for your own classroom. Um, yes, forgive my pun. Um, and yes, I'm at the University of Washington in Seattle, and I'm a PhD candidate in the last year of my dissertation. So if you like me, you can hire me. Uh, that's tongue in cheek, but also, you know, the job market's hard, everyone. Um, so the class that I um, designed that I'm talking about here. I am originally was specifically going to be about colonialism and it kind of grew into something broader just because um, students have interest in a lot of different topics. And also I just felt like with everything happening in the world with COVID, um, with the murder of George Floyd, with all this economic injustice, it just doesn't feel right to focus on only colonialism when there are so many intersections um, of social justice issues that need to be talked about in tandem. Um, so it kind of became it became this class that I designed called um, reading and writing um, board games for social justice. And it's a college writing class. Um, I've taught it twice. Once it was an intermediate level class and once it was um, an advanced level class. Um, the thing that surprised me when students came to this class was that most of them didn't consider themselves gamers and a lot of them had basically not played games besides Monopoly. Um, so the first time I taught, um, I kind of had to like back up and, uh, you know, we didn't play Spirit Island like I wanted to. We had to start a little simpler. Um, but it was actually kind of cool because um, I got to work with students who didn't consider themselves gamers and by the end of the course they were actually game designers, which was like, rockin'. Um, so you don't have to read this whole course description, but I can email it to you later if you're interested. Um, so the most important part is what I bolded is that we studied dominant cultural narratives um, and focused on a variety of topics. And then we sort of unpacked those and then did a like, well, what if we did this differently and sort of remix those ideas? Um, I say we like the students do the work because they're super cool and they know lots of great stuff. Um, so we used, um, some of this has already come up, I think Lauren Albright was mentioned in either the Discord or in the chat, um, but that's a really interesting essay, I think. Um, their required text was Tabletop Simulator, um, which 
mostly went well. There were some technical difficulties, especially at the beginning of COVID when people were kind of adapting to the online environment. Um, I did teach this both times during COVID. So this was all a Zoom class. I had planned it and then there was like a one to two week period between I'm teaching this in-person class about in-person games to, well, I guess it's online now. So um, it was an experience, but actually it's gone pretty well. Um, and I almost like teaching it online better than I think I would in person. But Tabletop Simulator actually was a really cool text, but students did run into um, some tech issues. So I'd be happy to talk about that more if anyone's interested in using Tabletop Sim as a text. Um, they used it for both gameplay and game design. Um, these are all different um, essays that they, or videos that they read or um, watched. Uh, we really used Asia Martinez's Storytelling as Resistance as a core idea. Um, she is a rhetoric and composition scholar and she's just awesome. Um, she does this anti-racist work around um, counter stories and um, one of the big things she talks about is stock stories. So basically these uh, dominant cultural narratives specifically about race and then counter stories. So how you can respond to those stories and flip them and challenge them in positive ways. Um, and counter stories are specifically about race and the way that she talks about them. So what we did was sort of inspired by that, but not um, not only um, that framework, because we did talk about race, but students also talked about other um, topics. So um, we use that as a base framework to kind of say, here is something that a narrative that's happening that's upholding um, some kind of privilege in a way that can be harmful to other people. And then here's a way that we could change that and make a game that's actually like really productive. So like some of the other games that people have been talking about today um, on both sides of that spectrum. Um, so they had a game analysis assignment, and to get into that assignment, we as a class played Settlers of Catan, which, by the way, is kind of hard to teach on Tabletop Simulator to people who haven't played a lot of games. Um, and then, um, sorry, I just noticed the Q&A. Um, Sorry, my brain went everywhere. Um, Settlers of Catan. So that was a little bit hard to teach to students who hadn't played a lot of games before, but it went it went great. And so these questions here are the questions that we talked through when playing Catan. And then there were subsequently the questions that they used for their own game analysis assignments where they picked a game to analyze. So they needed to identify the dominant narrative. So, for example, um, you all were talking about Mary was talking about settlers of Catan. Okay, there's this narrative of, oh, we come across this land, no one lives here, we can just kind of take resources. Um, unpacking that the specific um, narratives and what what's going on there. Um, and then the stakes of why does this matter, of course. Um, oh yeah, no, I love teaching tabletop sim. It's actually I I don't know. I love it. Um, I love helping people with their technical difficulties. Um, so stakes, of course, like why does this matter? This harms real people. This harms people historically. It changes narratives. It falsifies narratives. Um, this is a multimodal composition class. We looked at all these different modes of what is visually happening. How are these things reproduced through gameplay, etc. And then they came up with an idea for, well, what if this game were different? What would a different like version of this game look like? So Spirit Island is Spirit Island has its problems, as um, Mary pointed out, but it also, it could be an example of a game that challenges the ideas of Catan. But these were their own games they're thinking of, not existing games. So this is the what they did to start analyzing games and unpacking these narratives. Um, and then they moved to a game design project. Um, yeah, I was teaching this all during the for, first quarter of online teaching, so I made choices. Um, it went great, actually, um, and it was a lot of fun. So. It could have gone poorly. Um, so basically what students did was they created a game in teams, um, teams of three. Um, they made a rule book and a playable game, which they told me again and again that they wouldn't be able to do, but they did it and they were incredible. Um, and they had to make a claim. They had to be making an argument and it had to matter to someone. They had to say why it matters. They had to be persuading a specific audience and they needed to make it visually appealing and playable. So all those things sounded really hard to them and they were, and they worked hard and they were incredible. Um, so they did it, um, and I want to show you some stuff they did. Um, so first, I'm going to tell you about this game, Beyond Democracy. Um, a team made this, and um, as my student Pedro says, it's a satirical game that's intended to bring awareness to voter suppression and the specific ways voter suppression occurs. 
So in this game, basically the players buy up districts, they steal money from their opponents who are supposed to be other corrupt politicians, they bribe players, and they're literally supposed to be, as the rulebook says, deterring minorities and blue collar workers from voting. So this is a satirical game that is calling out voter suppression that happens in the world. So they're making an argument about this through a game. And as you all said, of course, games make arguments. Um, and this is what students were doing. They're making these arguments through games. So this is what Beyond Democracy, um, yeah, it's satirical as in, well, yeah, obviously it's pointing out real life problems. Yeah, but yeah, so we can see that they use these um, really smart images of basically the world on fire. Um, and uh, <laughs> yes, it's the world. And um, they basically were leaning into all these themes. So this is um, what they made in Tabletop Simulator. So it was a lot of dice rolling and pulling these cards um, and going around. And they had these little cubes that represented um, their currency that they could steal from each other. Um, it was completely playable and fun and um, felt very teachable that um, student other students came away from this thinking about, OK, actually, people are so their votes really are suppressed in the real world. And even though this is like a tongue in cheek game that really like leans into this, um, it is a real issue in the world. So that was one example that students made. Um, the next example is completely different. It's not satirical and it's focused toward children. Um, so they made completely different design choices, um, but this game was about um, microaggressions and teaching young children about microaggressions. There's this gorgeous paragraph that my student Stella um, wrote out, um, but I'm not gonna read the whole thing to you even though she's wonderful and wrote this very nicely. Um, but I do wanna show you the game. Um, so it's a tiny little game. It's a simple game for kids. There's like uh, two decks of cards and a die. Um, so basically they have a situation you read it and then you are um yeah it's basically a candy land map I, I said they could pull templates from whatever um but yeah so basically there's not a lot of choice in this game they pull something they read a situation um, that involves a microaggression and then they read a possible response they don't choose the response um but then they just are it's indicated whether it's a positive or negative response um so basically it's a conversation um, starting game for young kids to learn about microaggressions and how they could harm people it's not really like a strategy game so um like beyond democracy is um so really the point of this presentation was that um, I wanted to show you um, one way to teach um, some really complicated topics in board games to students and have them actually do not only the analysis, but also um, the game design part, even if they don't see themselves as game designers. Um, yeah, absolutely. Adults should play this game, too. Um, so. I, someone was pointing out in the chat that game design is really housed a lot in things like computer science. Um, and this, I believe that was Rebecca um, and also in chat. Um, and this doesn't necessarily break that out, but um, but we can start teaching games in other places. Um, so this is just one way to do it. And what I want to talk about potentially in the Q&A is if you're a teacher, how you might adapt this for your class in a different setting that might not be a writing class or might not be a college class. Um, other texts you would use, because I always like new ideas for things that my students read and watch, games you might play. I, I even forgot to tell you all some of the games we started with. We started simple. We started with Guess Who and talked about gender and race representation. We played Secret Hitler. We did point and click like Gamer Girl and the McDonald's game. I could talk so much about these games, but um, I'd also love to hear if you would focus on a specific theme, how you might do that. Um, thanks for my pun. Thank you for complimenting my puns. And if you want to contact me, I'd love to talk more or share any of these resources. Um, I'm trying to keep up with chat. Yeah, I really want to talk about more game remix things. I, I love it. Well, thank you all. Um, yeah, I want to stay within the time. Um, that is what I have. And I'd love to talk more about teaching and game remix and all that um, during the Q&A. Thank you, Sarah. Um, well, we only have one more presentation left, and it's Tanya Fabuda with Gender and Racial Representation in Board Games. Uh, Tanya is a board game designer, licensed uh, licensed drone pilot, um, someone who puts PowerPoint presentations in front of my bio text accidentally, um, artificial intelligence chatbot creator, and virtual automatic reality uh, practitioner. Her research on board games has been featured in the New York Times, Analog Game Studies, Plato Magazine, and various podcasts, including Stuff Your Mom Never Told Yourself, The Spiel, uh, Who, What, Why podcast, 
Meeple Syrup, Shelf Stories, and Beyond Solitaire. Um, so she's kind of a big thing in the board game community. Uh, she's a PhD candidate in Ryerson and York University's Communication and Culture Program um, with a 26-year-old background as a former journalist, certified project manager, digital storyteller with a background in public relations, communication, marketing, and web design. Um, and Tanya's work is just wonderful, groundbreaking, and the sort of stuff that is actively changing the hobby as we know it. So welcome, Tanya. Looking forward to your presentation. Thank you all so much. My goodness, these uh, your, the panelists were such tough acts to follow. I'm I'm a nervous wreck. These were all amazing presentations. So thank you so so much for having me. Um, so I'm just gonna uh, tell you a quick uh, brief story. Um, I used to make these things called corporate dashboards uh, for business leaders. And one of the things I learned doing that kind of work is that a lot of business leaders, uh, a lot of my research is targeted actually at the, the business of board games, uh, really privilege numbers over stories. So, you know, they'll hear stories and they'll say, well, you know, do, how do we know that's, you know, statistically significant. Is that an outlier? Is that just an exceptional case? So, you know, one of the, the, the reasons I started doing this work was actually to kind of create, um, you know, a bit of a, a, a business dashboard for the, the business of board gaming and also for the health of the hobby. And a shout out to my, my terrific advisor. I actually completely changed my dissertation topic. I was busily making v volumetric VR uh, chatbots. You could practice uh, awkward, painful uh, work-related conversations uh, with um, because I was focused on workplace bullying and harassment, actually. He's very patient. Uh, Dr. Boyd is an extremely patient person and a great advisor. So um, when I published my first uh, study in 2018, uh, Analog Game Studies was so, so great. Uh, great to publish it. Um, I actually had uh, like a significant whoosh of backlash, as I'm sure everyone in game scholarship is very familiar with. Uh, and I likened the experience to friends and family uh, about it was like being attacked by hundreds of bees uh, for weeks and weeks. And uh, one of the things that happened uh, very I don't don't recommend is it got picked up in the daily caller. Uh, my, my research on the demography of board game design and also the artwork. And uh, it was a really, really tough time. And I actually thought I might uh, throw in the towel. I was a little alarmed by the amount of backlash that I got. And this is something that I like to talk about in this context, because this is the dialogue that we're having out there in the world uh, with people um, who unfortunately um, don't think that representation uh, matters. And one of the things that happened during that 2018 uh, initial uh, small scale study release on analog game studies is I actually got a, a, a geek mail from Andrew Hackard, um, who, who sent me 500 geek gold and uh, said, I read your article in analog game studies. Um, thank you so much for laying it out, uh, laying out the numbers and urging us all to do better. I'm sharing this as widely as I can. And for, for me, a uh, switch actually flicked on in my brain. And I thought if somebody like Andrew Hackard, I actually sent him this effusive uh, fangirl note back um, saying I was, you know, the biggest Munchkin fan. I have all the Munchkin everywhere in my house. My, my house, there's a there's a root, there's a whole shelf that's dedicated to Munchkin variants. Um, and that I was an evangelist and that I would pay it forward. Um, that he gave me all this geek gold and I would pay it forward as, as best I could. And it was actually this pivotal moment, um, hearing from somebody who was so important in the industry uh, from Steve Jackson Games, such an important voice in the industry that I actually decided to make it my dissertation. And so I wanted to just pay tribute to Andrew, his, his incredible kindness, his welcome. Uh, he made me feel um, like this was important work. And uh, he sadly passed away in June of this year. So I just wanted to, to, to say that um, and that uh, without uh, Andrew's kindness, I, I don't know that I would be here today uh, in terms of uh, presenting this research. So I decided to expand out my, my initial study from 2018 and make my entire dis dissertation sort of doubling it in size, taking a look at a more expansive view of Board Game Geek as, an, as a site of cultural, the cultural practice of board gaming, the contemporary hobby board gaming um, uh, yes, sector hobby. And what I found, uh, once again, uh, so my previous findings were 93.5% white men in the in the in the business of board game design in that top 200 this was a top 400 and as you heard from from elizabeth hargrave's presentation it's overwhelmingly white male at 92.6 percent so that's the top 400 board game geek games 
And then I, you know, again, looked at the cover art and thought, you know, what's the empirical sweep? What's happening in the board game artwork? And what will I find in terms of one of the empirical building blocks of, you know, is there a skew um, toward whiteness and maleness in, in this instance with this more expansive uh, data set? And what I found in the top 200 board game geek uh, ranked games, uh, men versus women representation was skewed in the direction of, of, of maleness. So boys, men, uh, where I could determine gender, uh, I, I found that the human representation on the board game art was 76.8% men, boys, depictions of those, and 23.2% uh, women or girls. Okay, and um, this was the the, the racial skew. Um, Seventeen point five percent was BIPOC, Black Indigenous persons of color presenting in terms of the artwork, and eighty two point five percent was white, white presenting. So that's the the gender and racial skew of the artwork. Now, what's really interesting is I've actually been in dialogue uh, if for folks that are following. Uh, there's a board game geek thread that that happened uh, shortly after I, I, I appeared on uh, Shelf Stories, uh, which which does a great job of really talking about some of these issues within the board gaming hobby. And a, a really wonderful um, thread got started about Wingspan, about Elizabeth Hargrave and how um, this individual got his spouse, uh, you know, um, uh, his spouse is a woman, uh, didn't feel uh, particularly, didn't want to locate themselves in board gaming, wasn't interested in board gaming until Wingspan. And it was just really wonderful, heartfelt thread about how representation really mattered to this, this man uh, in getting his significant other, um, his wife, into the board gaming um, hobby. And one of the, the really thoughtful comments that cropped up in this thread is somebody saying, you know, the numbers, you know, looking at my numbers said the numbers are just a picture of the state of things, not how we got there. It's up to us to investigate the causes and, and how the and the conversations and as to why this happened, have those conversations. So one of the things that we all encounter tropes out there in the world uh, when we're talking about board games and representation, particularly in circles like Board Game Geek and other fora. And so one of the things I would do if I were doing a corporate uh, dashboard for a company, for a sector, is I'd start with a sort of 101 of audience um, audience metrics. So let's take a look at the US. Um, the US currently, right now, is a 40-60 split. Um, Black Indigenous persons of color make up 39.9% of the total population of the US. And, and white, uh, white individuals, non-Hispanic, make up 60.1%. So that's the US. That's just broad, rough brush uh, strokes in terms of demography. And that is, and I select the, the US marketplace because it is uh, bar none, the largest consumer marketplace in the world. Um, last year, a down year, um, the US citizens spent $12.5 trillion on durable and non-durable goods and services. Bar none, the largest consumer market in the world. So I focus there. But, and so what we found is, does the, the skew of representation in this artwork, this sample space of artwork make sense from a US market perspective? And we can answer definitively, no, it, it does not. It does not even match sort of rough, broad brushstrokes demography. There's obviously a, a, sing, a singular skew to whiteness and maleness in, in this, this uh, situation. And someone uh, rightly uh, challenged this and said, you know, it's important to note that board games are not US centric. This is this individual, you know, coming back. They're in fact global. And you need to consider a much wider data set to reach valid conclusions. So really challenging the conclusions about, you know, this skew doesn't make really good sense from even a, an audience 101 perspective. So fair enough. Um, so what I did was then I looked at more expansively a global frame. And what we can see is an 80-20 split. Black Indigenous persons of color make up 80% of the global population and white um, Caucasian um, demography is 20% of the globe. So under the, these circumstances, that makes, um, from a global more expansive frame, the artwork skew, um, the, the design demography skew makes very little sense. Okay, so we can discount that as a rationale for why, you know, board game companies um, Publishers are making these decisions. We can discount that outright. And then again, incidentally, and, and Elizabeth Hargrave did a great job with this, talking about just the, the, the breakdown of women in 
the US and Canada, which is where most of my research is focused. So in, in the US, it's 50.5%. So we make up a, a slim majority of the population uh, in the US, uh, women, um, and 50.4% in Canada. So just a little over half. So we can discount that as a, a rationale for why you know board game companies from an addressable market perspective might be making these decisions. So a big no there. And then you know delving into the urban um, city based market. So again, largest consumer hub in the world, uh, New York City, 57.27% black indigenous persons of color, and 42.73% is white in New York City. So if you're a board game publisher looking to crack into a, a really, really you know, vital consumer market, um, you're missing the boat. And then 47.28% in Los Angeles. And again, I just sort of arbitrarily picked two of the largest centers uh, in the US um, in this case, 47.28% um, BIPOC and 52.06% uh, white. So again, we can discount that as, you know, sort of a rationale for publishers making these times, types of choices. And then, you know, here in Canada, um, it's 50-50, uh, very similar to Chicago, 49.9% um, uh, BIPOC in, in Toronto, where I'm sitting right now, and 50.2% white, so 50-50. And you know the Greater Vancouver area, another big center for board game publishers, a very vital market. Sixty-seven point three percent Black Indigenous persons of color, and thirty-two point seven percent white. So these are not the. This is not the rationale for cracking into either the U.S. or Canadian market. The demography doesn't make sense. So there we see. We now we often encounter this pivot. Here's the pivot where, well, you know, maybe board gaming doesn't appeal to non-white audiences or certain religions or sexes as much. This is a trope. This comes up again and again. We've all encountered it. And slightly less articulately and slightly nastier, um, there is a, this is a quote from a thread uh, ongoing. There are some of us who simply do not have that gene. Like I said earlier, I know people who have no interest in gaming, so the statement that everyone likes or wants to game is false. And this thread continues, or I think it's actually stopped now, but continued for days and days at talking about how certain identities don't like to game, full stop. And so, you know, I actually um, decided to ask, okay, th this particular individual, why do you think board gaming is a niche hobby? And the reply was numbers. And so that's actually not a, it's a fair point, because if we were to go, and Elizabeth Hargrave spoke to this earlier, if we were to go by strictly sort of the consumerist, publisher, um, hobbyist kind of polls out there, you know, uh, web surveys, we might agree. 81.1% of the, the folks that, that filled out Stonemeyer Games demography survey in 2019 identified as men, okay? And you know, th this is another stat that I use in my dissertation, uh, Paxisms, uh, actually 99.99% uh, uh, in a 2016 survey, uh, men identified in terms of who's involved in wargaming in this case. And, but then we, we look and we can see that it, um, the video game demography gives lie to the notion that, well, certain identities don't like to game, but they do with video games demonstrating that the demography of people who avidly play digital board games or uh, digital uh, games are very diverse. And in Canada, um, it's actually 51% uh, now of all digital gamers are women. Um, and we know this, 46% uh, of all digital gamers are women in the US. And there's a very healthy demographic mix of people who are actively in um, in gaming, but not in board gaming. Um, so, you know, one of the, the great points that, you know, my committee has made is, is this, this notion that board games um, is potentially, per just per jewel, in a bit of a hardcore valley, a gate-kept, protected community that has a very homogenous look and feel, very similar to the trajectory of the video game industry. So board games could potentially be in a hardcore valley that we're desperately trying to claw our way out of. And so, you know, not content with just some of these speculations, I did delve into quite extensively a massive survey of avid board gamers. Uh, I, I promoted it on BGG, uh, Reddit, and Twitter, and got 320 participants. This was done in late 2020. 
And what I found, and this is just a really brief snapshot, I, mean, I have other slides, if we have questions later, I can delve into more, more deeply, but you know, 73.8% uh, were from North America, the respondents, 60.4% identified as women uh, from the respondents in the survey, that includes trans women, trans identified women, 74.9% um, uh, identified as white, 20.4% identified as BIPOC, I wanted a much higher BIPOC participation rate, but I got that. 52.8% um, uh, identified as LGBTQ+. And there's a lot of other stats. This was a very, very extensive survey of about 123 questions. And I triangulated, I asked redundant questions. And I really encouraged a lot of sharing about demography. It was anonymous, so there was no, um, they didn't feel like they, they had to hide certain aspects of their identity because it was fully anonymized. And what is really interesting about that is just about everybody who participated in the survey, this was not intended, but it happened, had a BGG profile. So the vast majority of the respondents um, were B ad avid BGG um, users who were actually participating and found my survey on the BGG fora and have a profile. And of this pool, 70.7% .7 game board gamed at least weekly. So quite avid and 53.5% had more than 11 years in the hobby. So by any measure, they pass a nerd check, a uh, nerd cred check uh, in, in almost any, any kind of, of, of situation. So the people who, who filled out my survey are very invested in board games. And one of the interesting things that, that it is raised and I raise it too, is I'm only gonna get access to people who, who evidence their board game interest. So it's very, very difficult to get people who maybe are more casual about it. And what I ended up getting was pretty hardcore board gamers um, responding to this survey. So one of the interesting findings, you know, remember, this is a majority white um, uh, a group that is, is talking about this um, and providing these perspectives. I'm uh, kind of, yeah. apologies, but you're out of time. So if you could just kind of wrap up the findings in one or two sentences, that'd be great. Yeah, no, no worries. So 81.5% said they wish publishers would publish more games designed by women designers. 81.7% wished more BIPOC designers were published. Um, and, you know, I can actually end it there. Um, and then we can just, if there's questions or people want to delve into the, the, the findings a little bit more, I am so happy to do that. I think that's a great note to leave it on. Um, if there are any questions for Tanya's presentation, if anybody's interested in more of the slides, please put that in the Q&A. We'd love to, to show more of this work or any of the work of the presenters that, that came before, but we only have 20 more minutes to tack. And so I wanna make sure that we have some conversation between you all also, because these were all amazing and wonderful presentations. Um, so we have two questions in the chat already. Um, so I'll, I'll begin with those. And then as they come in, we'll keep on going through them. So the first question is for Rebecca. Um, Moises, Lino Moises says, thank you for your great presentation. Can you elaborate on whether the rules for Oella and Sango are inspired by some cultural practices of the respective creators in the same way as chess was, for example, uh, was, example, long influenced by an understanding of war? Sorry. Oh, thank you. That, that's definitely a great question. So let me start with, uh, they are. And, and I will go to the extent to say that, uh, for example, when I take the example of the Songo, uh, uh, one, one of the rules of Songo is that you have what you call in Czech, like you build a house where you kind of protect yourself. And then you build a house because, uh, again, remember that this kind of a farmer kind of environment where uh, having food and store and then preparing for the next season is really important. So you build a house, so you put seed in such a way that your opponent cannot uh, capture the seeds, uh, capture your seeds in the next hole. And then what happens then with that is that you want to make sure that even if you are losing, you do not lose without having five uh See that at least. If you lose uh, without having at least ha without having captured five seats, then you kind of ostracize from the community because the idea is that you don't you want to make sure that um, your opponent do not does not go hungry because the belief is that if someone is hungry and does not have food, then he will go around stealing. So, uh, so those are kind of the rules. So definitely, and then when you can, we, you you talk about the Oweila game, absolutely. Because again, remember that these are kind of um, cattle herders. And then one thing that's really important is that it's called a strategy. It also was used uh, historically to teach kids how to protect the cattle. So the how that so one thing that you want to make sure is that you do not at least you have to have 
one uh the how they call it um one cutter right in the uh in your in the hole so you make sure you do not so those is definitely uh I would just stop there to say that it's definitely kind of shaped by the culture, the core practice that, that, yeah. And that's something that I would definitely have to expand a little bit more on that. But thank you for the question. No, that was a great answer. All right, so here's a question for the entire panel. Um, Nick Kaxmarek asks, um, he'd love to hear you all speak more about the mechanics that we could replace colonial, competitive, and resource control mechanics with. How might we develop mechanics of social justice mechanics of decolonization, mechanics of cooperation, et cetera. Very curious what you all have to say about that question. I, I did a workshop using uh, Dr. Flanagan's Grow a Game uh, with uh, undergrad students at, uh, at X University. And, uh, and that was a, an amazing methodology. And the students came up with so many wonderful uh, redos of terrible games, so. That's that's how you that's how I recommend. It's it's a it's an amazing, amazing tool. Well, that's a plug. Um, <laughs> thank you. That's really I'm honored. Um, you know, that's really when uh, Michaela and I started off writing the, the playing oppression book, we we met at Essen. He's a colleague of mine. He teaches at MIT and I teach at Dartmouth. And he, and we were at Essen. I was actually manning a booth, womaning a booth, whatever, veying a booth. I don't know what I was doing with a booth, but I was ho hosting a booth. And they, um, I, I just kept getting these bizarre, like people called me like lady game designer, la la la. And like, it was just a very bizarre situation. Um, but um, we got together and we're like, I can't believe what's being released. I can't believe we had to do something. So we, we set about this book project and it, it, it started off, of course, on the surface, right? Wow, these problematic themes and problematic this and problematic that. But then when you really dig into the history of the development of the mechanics, which really, I haven't seen very many, I, I mean, I really haven't read anybody doing that. Um, it seems really tied to troubling stuff. And so we detail that in the book, which I, uh, people have asked in the chat, it's like, it's coming out hopefully, I think in, it, it's at MIT Press, it's finished, so it should be uh, spring 2022. But for example, there are things for like, uh, if I were going to compare something like Settlers of Catan to Agricola, right? Agricola actually has an invest and and kind of take time there there are there are there are there's a, there's a kind of more sustainable model in terms of getting resources you have to invest in your resources not i'm not plugging one game over another but there are certain things like where um you know where resources run out <laughs> what do you do in finite resources what do you do with um with uh you know and co-op games also have some things so these are just general general themes but i think there are, there are examples emerging um, that let us kind of diverge away from, away from the problematic uh, mechanics, but it's, it takes work on the part of the designer and it takes trust on the part of the publisher to publish that stuff. Yeah, I think, oh, oh, sorry, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, I just spoke, oh. so go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna say, um, I think it's a tricky question because certainly there are mechanics that tend to be more problematic, like um, resource gathering. Um, but I think it's it's more how the resources are, in, or not resources, the mechanics are engaged with um, and presented that is more of the issue. Because um, for example, in cooperative games, um, so someone was asking in chat about, um, about the actual presentation of rules. And I was just thinking about how in cooperative games, um, there's often a person who kind of, or not often, there can be a person who kind of takes over and that can reproduce a lot of um, pro problematic power dynamics too. So um, even um, mechanics that are framed in cooperation can be issues. So I think it's really about how we frame games and um, in our in our own teaching of them and in our um, artifacts like rule books and in um, how the game is marketed, et cetera. So um, certainly I think there are, I don't really have an answer to this question of what the best mechanics are, but I think it's really about like how we frame those mechanics and how they serve the game and what the actual meaning and symbols of it is, as well as how we engage with it. 
Thank you. If I may quickly jump in, uh, it's a very interesting question. But the game I've studied, um, the game I presented, Songo, for example, is a game strategy board game that's competitive. But the rules of the game, though, is that you do not play alone because the community is more of a, a communal approach to everything. So you always want to make sure that you help your partner when you play the game, right? So it's more like the, 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 the collaboration is embedded in the game. So you, you, you become better as your opponent is. So you're helping within the, the uh, while you're playing. So it's a very, uh, and I remember when I was presenting it to uh, my committee, they were like, how can it be competitive, right? Because and then again, this is a kind of a more of a Western kind of approach to everything. So I think when we start looking at other contexts, how people are doing things, uh, that would be definitely be interesting because it's competitive, but again, that collaboration is just embedded uh, within the game. So um, that's all I wanted to add. Thanks for those great answers. All right, so the next question um, is a challenging one, and it's a little bit fragile, so uh, be careful. Uh, but uh, wonderful, wonderful presentations. As a cis white male amateur game designer, how can I ensure that my games don't further the hom homogeneity of, representat of representation in games? Can someone be thoughtful of appropriation and celebrate a broader perspective without being exploitative of voices and stories that aren't their own? Collaborate is my first, that's my really short answer. And if you're not gonna co-design with somebody, um, talking to people who um, either are related to your theme or your game, or who it may some, some may in some way be impacted by it. And when you're play testing, make sure you have a group of people that is diverse in as many ways as possible playing your game and um, in an environment where they feel that they can give you genuine, honest feedback. Um, but I think, yeah, collaboration with more people is good too. We have a few more questions, but if anyone has one more bit that they want to get in there, we have some space. I think that's a terrific answer. Collaboration, talk to people, um, you know, that's that's one key dynamic I think I see in, in board gaming is it's often auteurs um, who are, you know, not uh, maybe using stories that are rattling around in their head and maybe not talking to people. Um, they're, you know, replicating uh, Joseph Campbell's monomyth and it's the white, white uh, hero alone came, claiming his lady love is a little recursive. So yeah, talk to people, collaborate for sure. Next question, um, for whoever wants to answer, many game designs designers seem to run into the problem of abstraction versus integration when dealing with colonialism or other sensitive themes. On the one hand, it's problematic to leave important histories under unrepresented. But on the other hand, it might not always be productive to gamify systems of oppression. How do you feel about this problem? Is this a false dichotomy? Oh, maybe you want to go? Go ahead. No, I go. Please, please, Rebecca. Okay, I just want. I just want to take a jab. I didn't say. Okay, I definitely agree with you that uh, gamifying, you know, a system of patients. That's uh, is definitely uh, something that you want. Is is um is a slight so I I feel like there's no right or wrong answer, and then sometimes I I just say that when you find yourself in such a position. You just go back and you ask your question, like, what, what's your end goal, right? So what do you want to do with this? What kind of impact, right? So I always remember the question that uh, they always have that. that. So uh, the, uh, why I, uh, who are you des designing it for? Why are you designing it for? And then with whom are you designing it? So I think if you address those questions, that will help you to kind of, you know, try to decipher that. And that's just uh, the answer, the help that I can give here. Thanks. All right. Oh, uh, go ahead. Sarah, did yeah. you have an answer you want to put in there? Um, no, Rebecca had a great answer. I don't need to add. There were a lot of questions. Great. Um, <clears throat> moving on, um, this story is a question for Sarah, but it's not being extended to everybody. Um, uh, Samara Haley Steele is curious about how you would address colonial practices in metagaming, or uh, for those of you unfamiliar with the term, the game that takes place in discourse around the game. How might we? Um, we respond to colonial practicing embedded adjacent to how the game is played, such as who gets to read the rules to the group, 
who gets to lead the rounds, et cetera. I just um, uh, had a colleague and, and I gave a talk about the tyranny of structurelessness, uh, an old uh, Joe Freeman thing where, you know, the, the systems, the oppressive systems and societal structures replicate themselves even in, you know, a, a structuralist group. And so that's a huge dynamic that happens in every work team. You know, I often get asked to take minutes uh, or, um, you know, it's, it's just, we, we settle into these, these old roles, uh, oppressive systems of power, and you got to be so mindful of it. And I do it too. You know, I'm, I'm 50. I uh, worked, uh, you know, in industry and um, I got a lot of unlearning to do, and we all do. And I think we've got to be serious about unlearning some of our bad habits and implicit biases. Um, and that's why, you know, that's why I'm doing this work because uh, it's got to, it's got to stop. Um, the way we work isn't working and uh, the way we play is, is needs, needs some help. All right, I'm just going to move on. Um, skipping a question because we've heard from the person who asked it first. If we have time, we'll come back to it. Uh, but the next question on the list is a curiosity about the tension between traditional and competitive classroom structures and game structures slash mechanisms. I'm trying to experiment with ways to restructure the classroom on the basis of game design as part of decolonizing work. Any suggestions? Can I ask well, a clarifying question of what you mean by traditional competitive classroom structures? I, I don't know because I didn't write the question, but I oh, assume right. it is um, like grade based uh, competition in the classroom. Well, I think I'll, I, I wouldn't mind jumping in on this because I've been teaching game design for like, I don't know, maybe it's like 20 years or something. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a long time. Anyway, I don't want to talk about the length, but, but the idea of how you um, restructure the classroom is really important. How you, how you even set up, like for example, if you have a waiting list, which you probably all do of um, 40 or 50 people to get into your class, um, perhaps you would prioritize um, the inclusion of the non-typical gamer stereotype as, uh, as part of your classroom structure. Perhaps you would uh, make sure everyone gets a turn to play and talk um, and you slow things down so that every, so that you're not actually just feeding gamers, right? Because there's a fan base of avid gamers who feel very entitled to talk about what they believe. And that's part of what you have to manage and understanding that not everyone has feels entitled in that way. So, so I think it's a huge part of why I have a majority of, I mean, I have a majority, um, classroom people of color and women in my classes, you, you can sculpt that you can, you can, you can take agency in that it does not have to be dominated um, in, in a particular demographic way. And it, but it takes intention right from the beginning, even before the classes started. Any other answers to that question? All right, moving on. Um, this is a fun one. Um, do any panelists have designers or publishers that they want to call out as positive models in the current space? Does it have to be designers and publishers? Um, I, you know, I, I want to just give a shout out. My my uh, my dissertation is actually entitled. Uh, I didn't see anyone that looked like me, and that's a that's a reference to something Maddie Hutchinson um, said uh, in an interview. And uh, Suzanne Sheldon and, and, and Mandy Hutchinson actually started me on this journey. So I'd like to give them a shout out because they're incredible analysts, incredible cultural analysts um, in this space and do such important work. Um, Eric Lang, uh, definitely, um, definitely a positive role model, without a doubt. Just to quickly jump in, I, I posted, I, I had an inspirational future slide that I didn't get to, um, including Coyote and Crow, Chai, Wingspan, Monstrosity, a whole bunch of games by um, uh, various groups who bring new voices to the game design space. And so I put that in the Discord in our, under our panel. Sarah or Rebecca? I don't have anything to add. Those are good suggestions. Yeah, I don't have anything either. Great. Um, all right, well, I think we have time for one final question. There is only one question left and um, that's for Tanya. Um,
but if anyone else wants to weigh in on it, of course, it's the final question. So like, you know, sometimes there's just a pressure to get that, that last little bit in, uh, especially if something triggers in your mind. Um, but Tanya, is there a way to collect historical sets of data in order to see if the representation of gamers have changed over time? For instance, if there have been any changes, even slight ones over the past decade? You know, uh, Dr. Croft, that is a great, great question. And one of the things that uh, Elizabeth Hargrave spoke to so well is the idea that it's really tough to find people. So I'm very conscious of the fact that the people who fill out my survey are people who are self-selecting, who are in the space already. What haunts me is who left, who isn't there, who isn't, you know, talking about this. And one of the dynamics in the data, um, Dr. Croft, is the idea that... Um, a lot of people say, I, I, I stay away from public events. I don't talk about this stuff online. It's because for a variety of reasons, you know, childcare, access to leisure time, but also harassment and, and sexism, homophobia, uh, transphobia, and uh, ableism and uh, racism keeps them out of the space. So identifying, and, and Elizabeth Hargrave talked to this so well, it's tough to get a census of board gamers, but everyone I encounter, board games, everyone, with very uh, few exceptions. Um, it's just, what do we define as a gamer? What do we define as a board gamer? And so it's a great question, and I would love to collaborate with you on that. Uh, Dr. Croft also did a great analysis of family bo board game designers as well, which I highly recommend. Great answer to that question. Well, thank you all for your time. This was such an interesting and exciting panel, and I'm so sorry that I had to to end a few of the talks so early, there was just so much good stuff coming and I felt terrible doing that. So I'm just uh, so happy that you all presented and looking forward to seeing all this work um, in the future online. So thank you all. And thank you all for staying for all of Generation Analog today. Um, we're gonna be back at 10 a.m. tomorrow morning, Eastern time. And um, just looking forward to an amazing day on role-playing games as the focus tomorrow. So thanks all, this has been an amazing conference so far. I hope you stay for the entire thing and join us for the reception tomorrow night at the end. So see you tomorrow. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Evan. Thank thanks, you all everybody. so much. Thanks so much. Great job, everybody. Thank you all so much. Thank you. It was a great panel, by the way. So we keep in touch. Oh, Rebecca. <laughs> yeah, right? So we find that you meet, right? So definitely keep in touch. I will send you an email, no worries. Hey, Tanya. Hey, hey. Nice to meet you Sarah, all. Good to meet you. Nice to meet you all. Bye. Stay in touch. Ciao, ciao. Yeah. Bye. Yeah. <laughs>